when I was about four years old. My father had uh, taught me a series of numbers. I don't remember them now. Something like 627, 1,200 and something, and a third number. And what he would do is take me to, into the store, you know, sitting on his shoulders, and if the butcher or whatever kind of store it was would say, oh, cute, cute, my dad would say, and he's smart too, what's 50 plus this plus this? And I'd say, oh, 187. And then he'd say, well, what's the square root of something? And I'd give the answer. And they'd be like, oh. you know. And then they'd catch on on the third one, which was impossibly. But I noticed that they left. And, uh, and my father said, that's because they have a good sense of humor. And I thought, what is that, you know? And he told me that, you know, the people find, some people find funniness, uh, in a lot of things, and some people are just average, and some people don't find, but anyone who laughs has a good sense of humor. He said, and you have. He told me, I have one. And I thought, well, that's a good thing. Then, in first grade in um, Socorro, uh, what's it called when it's at church school? Parochial, where some of my, my best, uh, well, first grade, I was there. And the eighth graders were giving a um, chorus concert. And they want, thought it'd be fun to have a first grader conduct. So I had to get like a little tuxedo jacket and cut off pants. And I didn't want to. See, I was scared of a crowd. And uh, my mother said, I'll give you a quarter. Well, that was 1940-something, so a quarter was big stuff to a little kid. And I, I, I was really nervous before I went on. When I went on and acted very formal and took a little bit of a bow, I got laughs. And I thought, I know what to do here. I know what to do. So I hammed it up, you know, directing, over, over directing the chorus, right? And then at the end, instead of just bowing once like that, I bowed once with that and then switched hands and bowed again and did like, please, please, no. And got screams. And I, I said, I gotta do this. I've got to do this. I've gotta find a way to do this. There was um, a, a station here in town, KGRT. It still exists. It was one of two back in the days of AM only. And in the afternoon, they had a remote with a little remote unit, and they'd go to different businesses and say, hey, come on down. We have free this, free that. Uh, standard radio remote. And uh, my friends knew I did impressions of famous people. And they said, let's go down there and you can do those. And, they, and I thought, boy, that, that would be a neat thing. So we got over to the Shamrock Drive-In, I think it was called. And the announcer stuck the mic in the window and said, well, who do we have in this car? You know. And the driver said, well, we have Ed Sullivan, we have Jackie Gleason, we have... So, and he says, really, uh, where's Ed? So I went into my Ed Sullivan, you know, and they said, we could use some of those voices in our commercials. And so they had me do types, you know, like a gangster, gangster type. Ah, that's right, did they? you know, got a New York accent, did they? you know, that thing. And then I asked if I could get my own show. And it was, they gave me a one hour on a Saturday afternoon. And it was promoted heavily. And I thought, you know, these poor souls, you're listening to all this rock and roll stuff, and I myself love jazz, and therefore, it must be better. <laughs> uh, so I did my stuff and played my jazz that I liked, and to the person, I, the response was, well, you're funny and everything, but what are you playing? What is that music? And I thought, how can they not like that? Well, what do you want? And they said, oh, Elvis Presley, Fats Domino. And it's like, really? I just thought they hadn't heard you. See, I learned something at age 16 that most general managers, or many general managers, don't know now. What they uh, uh, personally like has nothing to do with what should go on the air. Not if you want ratings. Not if you want to earn a living. So, the following Saturday, I gave it to, I, I went to the retail record store to find out what was selling. I mixed it kind of with the Billboard magazine and I played like pure concentrated rock and roll. And I destroyed every song. I said horrible things about the 
artists, you know, just with little tapes and things, you know. Uh, and, and I thought it's going to upset him. But it didn't. And, and they said, now that is a show. That's a show. That, now you got it. You got it. This would be like 1959, and uh, I got an offer from one of the only three all music stations, or top 40 is what it became, in the country, which was KELP 920 AM. And they put me on midnight to six when there's really nobody listening. <laughs> I mean, not many sets in use. But I was terrified because I thought, I, I felt like I was on network radio and I was alone in the control room. I hadn't really learned the board very well, the controls, and scared to death. But I did my little stuff, my little hour, tracks and well, tapes and yeah, stuff like that. And I started getting calls, positive, from the audience. And, uh, and they said, yeah, by the way, Crossman, yeah, it's you know what? Don't booyah, get that not booyah. So I had a tape that said something like, I had mispronounced the name of the school, and some guy on tape said, that's because you're a moron or something, you know. My favorite interview never got on the air. Uh, it was when I met James Brown, and I asked him, instead of saying, oh, Mr. Brown, I think you're the greatest performer, yada, yada, which, of course, he is, and I, I asked him, what do you, so what do you think, not, not hello, how are you, <laughs> nothing. Yeah, you know, in his dressing room after the show. And I said, what do you think happens to our souls or our spirits after the body dies? And uh, there was a lady there serving us some orange crush of a big tub. And he said, Miss, Miss Johnson, I believe I'd like to speak to this young man alone for a few minutes. That launched a two and a half hour conversation in which we laughed and cried. We, it's like kindred soul. Instant friends, and he's helped me out a lot. Now he keeps crediting me, which I play this. I mean, I play the songs because they're popular. I'd be a fool not to. Um, but he, I think he has a. Well, you're not going to be able to fit this in here, but Channel Seven has a tape. I haven't done it, where the two of us are being interviewed, and I'll ask him a question, and he'll say, "I think you better ask Brother Steve. He knows a lot more." He's so generous uh, with his free. fame, see, and with his, his magnetism. He, he gives it to other people. And he's such a good guy, basically good guy, and a superstar, but not affected at all.